Good morning. Three separate shootings in under three hours. Police are calling them intentional targeted attacks. What we're learning about them this morning and a reported missing person in Bradford County where police and his family say he was last seen. Plus a large structure fire breaking out in Cohocton. What we know this morning. This is 18 News Today. Live from your local news leader, this is 18 News Today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Wilson. Today is Sunday, September 19th. And I'm Jacob Matthews. Thanks for joining us for 18 News Today. Those stories and much more are coming up in just a few minutes, but first, Jacob has your forecast. Yep, another foggy start to our day. 58 degrees is the current temperature in Elmira. The 97% humidity is what's giving that fog, as can be seen from that camera. Heading into the afternoon, we'll start to see a bit of clearing. Actually, it's not afternoon, I'm sorry. Heading more into the morning, we'll start to see a bit of clearing as that fog and the clouds uh, start to move a bit uh, down south from our area. Current temperatures sitting in Elmira and the Twin Tiers are sitting in the 50s. But that will not last forever as we head into the afternoon where the temperatures will eventually rise to the 70s with plenty of sunshine. Much more clear, much more clearing will happen at this time like uh, it will happen later this morning. All right, thanks, Jacob. We begin this morning in Elmira, where three separate shootings in less than three hours took place. Police say they responded to the calls between Friday night and early Saturday morning. Police say all three shootings were intentional targeted attacks. The first was reported shortly before 11 p.m. on Pomafroy Place. Someone allegedly shot through an apartment with two young children inside. Fortunately, no injuries were reported. Later on, police responded to a second shooting just before 1 a.m. on the 300 block of East Warren Street. Multiple people were sleeping inside and say they were woken up by gunfire. Police found gunshots that hit the home, but no injuries were reported. And finally, a third shooting was called in just after 1.30 on Saturday at a house party on the 300 block of Euclid Avenue. 25 to 30 people were inside when police say someone turned off the lights and opened fire. Three people were shot and transported to the hospital, one in serious but stable condition. Police say the investigation is ongoing and that anyone with information on these shootings should contact the Elmira Police Department. And a reminder that 18 News is tracking all shootings that happen here in Elmira. We have an interactive map that contains details of each incident on our website, mytwintears.com. Com. Fire departments from across Juben County responded to a structure fire in Cahocton. It happened around 6 o'clock last night. Reports say flames could be seen coming out of the building near North Dansville Street in the village. Fire departments from Atlanta, Wayland and other towns in the northwestern portion of the county were called out to that two alarm fire. Now 18 News reached out to the fire department, but we have not heard back at this time. Also this morning, a reported missing person in Bradford County, Zachary James of Metuchen, New Jersey, was last seen on Tuesday, September 14. Pennsylvania State Police reported that Toth was missing on Friday. He's described as a white male, about 5 feet 9 inches tall and around 220 pounds. He had been staying at a residence in Wysox, Pennsylvania for the past several months and was last seen by his family on the morning of September 14th. He is believed to have left that home the day on that day between 1140 and 340 p.m. Toth has not been in contact with his family since that time, and uh, police say he may be traveling back to New Jersey. If you have any information regarding the whereabouts of him, please contact the Pennsylvania State Police in Tawanda. Meanwhile, Governor Kathy Hochul signed off on the Less Is More Act in New York City on Friday morning. The legislation aims to reduce the number of people who are behind bars due to technical parole violations like consuming alcohol, are missing a curfew. It will also reward those who don't violate conditions of supervision with quote earn time credits. The bill was carried in the Senate by now Lieutenant Governor Benjamin or Brian Benjamin. When you look at how we incarcerate in New York State, I believe we incarcerate way beyond the need for public safety and a lot of it is fear driven and based in old models and tactics. 
That bill takes effect in March of 2022. There's a possible new program in Steuben County that could be cracking down on uninsured drivers. Our 18 News reporter Kevin Gefeller spoke with the DA about the program and has more. The Steuben County Traffic Diversion Program may be getting an update in the near future. The diversion program is designed to enable traffic ticket offenders to resolve their current vehicle and traffic tickets quickly and easily. The district attorney is now considering a second program targeted at reducing the number of uninsured drivers on the road through more license plate readers. The FAA plate is um it's then checked against DMV records, and if it turns out that vehicle is unregistered and uninsured, a notice would be sent. It'd be flagged for law enforcement. We would confirm that it is, in fact, the vehicle is actually in violation, and they'd be sent a notice saying, hey, look, your, your vehicle is uninsured. Uh, that's a violation of the law. Uh, that violation of law carries with it the possibility of a license suspension, a $500 civil penalty, as well as the, the penalties that go to the ticket, and, and you're uninsured, which is unsafe and, and puts all the rest of us at risk. The offender would then have the choice of attending an educational class on insurance where the ticket would be waived. The cost of this program would be half of that it would cost to face the civil penalty and ticket. Baker saying he is not sure when this would go into effect, but it could be soon. I would expect it'll take us several months to uh, be in a position to uh, to put this into effect if we're in a position to do it. Obviously, we are we're working with our county attorney and our legislature to make sure what we do is lawful uh, and that um, you know, everything we do maximizes the ends of, of public safety. Baker also said these additional license plate scanners could be used for things like flagging stolen vehicles or finding a missing child. Reporting in Elmira, Kevin Gefeller, 18 News. Your time now, 707. Still ahead on 18 News today, the story that is gripping the nation. A 22-year-old missing after going on a trip with her fiancé. We have the latest, including the twist in which police say her fiancé is also missing. And a comfortable start to the week is in store for us, but the true start to the fall season will say otherwise. More details on that coming up later on 18 News. You're watching 18 News Today.
Welcome back. A few hundred people gathered near the Capitol in Washington, D.C. to protest the treatment of those who were jailed in the January 6 riot. Protesters were largely peaceful, though some of the people who attended were wearing riot gear. Capitol Police say there were four arrests, but it's not clear that some of those people that were arrested were actually part of that rally. The rally did end less than 90, 90 minutes after it began, and by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it was largely cleared. Meanwhile, a small group of people gathered at the Freedom Plaza to counter protest the events of that rally. That rally called DC Means Don't Come was planned, by, was planned by organizers who say they want to, quote, remind the world that DC isn't welcome to fascists. Law enforcement agencies were present along the perimeter of that plaza. Just over a handful of protesters carried large umbrellas. At times, they would block the media from getting a clear shot of that event. And unlike the protesters at the Capitol, there were no planned speakers. On the West Coast, flames from an oil refinery lit up the night sky after a 4.3 magnitude earthquake struck LA Friday night. The flames were caused by a quote, controlled flaring event, a marathon petroleum refiner by a marathon petroleum refinery in Carson, California. The earthquake triggered a loss of power at the refinery, leading them to conduct flaring. The company Somebody says it was a safety measure that takes place in the event of an earthquake of that magnitude and that there was no danger to the public when it happened. And it's a story that's grabbing national headlines. 22 year old Gabby Petito from Suffolk County, New York, was reported missing on September 11th while traveling across the U.S. with her fiance. Her family lost contact with her in late August when she was in or near a national park in Wyoming. Now her fiance's parents saying they have not heard from him since Tuesday. Our sister station in Tampa has the latest. The search for Gabby Petito's fiance, Brian Laundrie, is unfolding in Jennifer Anderson's front yard. It's really crazy to wake up and see your house kind of surrounded by police. She lives at the entrance to the Myakkahatchee Creek Environmental Park, where police are attempting to locate Laundrie, a person of interest in Gabby's disappearance. They say family claims he was heading here Tuesday and hasn't been seen since. The first time that we've had any in-depth conversation with them was, was yesterday. Uh, their attorney called and said that uh, uh, the family is concerned about Brian's whereabouts. Um, they would like to file a missing persons report. Resources from multiple agencies, including the FBI, are out in the 200 acre park, which opens into the 25,000 acre Carlton Reserve. We've got 50 uh, plus folks. Uh, we've had drones in the air. We've got uh, bloodhounds, canines, uh, four wheelers, uh, side by sides. Uh, certainly uh, out there. It's very wet. Leaders from the Northport Police Department are hopeful they'll find laundry, but say in the meantime, he could be in danger. I think that's fair to say. I mean, you have somebody, <clears throat> there's an enormous amount of uh, pressure, uh, I'm sure, on him to provide answers and what's going on here. Uh, we knew we would uh, deal with Brian eventually, um, but this is certainly a twist. As a mom, Anderson says she feels for both families. It's a sad story, it really is, so I'm just hoping they can get resolution and get it resolved. Time now, 7.13, still to come on 18 News Today. Only a few, hour, only a few hours left of the Harvest Festival in Corning. What festivities you can expect this morning if you're heading out to Market Street. And fog is still lingering around in the area, as can be seen from the Elmira Corning Regional Airport, but that will soon change. I will have more details in my forecast coming up next.
Good morning and happy Sunday. Expect some fog in the early morning hours, but that will soon change this afternoon as it clears up with plenty of sunshine and sunshine will continue for the first half of the week. But as we head into next week, we'll start to feel the fall like conditions as the fall season starts with cooler, lower temperatures and drier and more comfortable conditions. Speaking of drier conditions, we can see with given this high pressure system that conditions are drying up around in our area with uh, no chances of rain or cloud cover at all. This cold front down here has also given us much lower temperatures. Heading into uh, the region, the, uh, the clouds and the fog that I mentioned uh, earlier for this uh, morning will eventually subside down south. This will lead the way for mostly clear skies and plenty of sunshine as mentioned before. Taking a look for the rest of the day, we can see this high pressure system. High pressure system will move out into the, uh, the New England states. Monday that will uh, eventually change uh, when the high pressure system moves into Maine and closer to the Atlantic. When that happens, we will in be introduced with a, a bit more cloud cover for uh, Monday night. Tuesday will then be introduced to a low pressure system out into the Great Lakes. And as that low pressure system crosses its way just north of us, we'll, we'll eventually see some scattered rain showers heading into our area from the Midwest. This will be the story for Wednesday morning and afternoon as a cold front passes by from that uh, area as well. Temperature is currently sitting in the 50s for the twin tiers as of right now, but that will eventually change as we head into the afternoon. Dew points are also sitting comfortably in the 50s. This, will, this is giving us the, the dry and comfortable weather that uh, we all uh, love and enjoy. I enjoy it as well. I was tired of the humidity yesterday, but finally we got the dry weather. Temperatures are sitting at 74 for the high temperatures today. Sorry, high temperature 74. Sunshine, nice and dry, no chance of precipitation. As we head into tonight, a few clouds may uh, pull in with a, a low temperature of 48 degrees and some patchy fog again, much like uh, this morning. Heading into the first half of the week, um, more sunshine for uh, Tuesday, but we will start to see some increase in clouds as that low pressure system starts to move in. Chance for, chance for scattered showers starts Wednesday. At the start of the fall season, we'll then uh, show some temperatures dropping down to the 60s with scattered showers still uh, lingering around on Thursday. And, the condition, and conditions will then lead to mostly sunny as we head into the end of the week and into the weekend. All right, thanks, Jacob. The annual Harvest Festival is back in Corning the entire weekend. Four blocks of Market Street will be closed for traffic for those festivities. As Gayford District restaurants and businesses showcase their fall offerings, there will be live music from local and regional musicians as you stroll down Market Street. That is closed off. All events are free and open to the public. And of course, you're encouraged to bring your lawn chairs. Organizers tell 18 News they are excited about the festival this year. Come hungry because we are a great dining destination and come ready to shop. Our businesses have some really cool fall items for them to enjoy as well. And of course our ice cream shops have some delicious harvest flavors as well. Just come enjoy stroll. It's supposed to be a beautiful day. And it's supposed to be a good day again today, too. That festival runs until this afternoon at 1 o'clock. Your time now, 719. Still ahead on 18 News today. The latest on New York's hiring freeze put in place during the pandemic. Why it's suddenly coming to an end.
Welcome back. New York's hiring freeze put in place during the pandemic has been lifted through the end of this fiscal year. That means state agencies can now hire without getting a waiver from the Division of Budget. Governor Kathy Hochul made that announcement on Thursday. It comes after she released an updated state financial plan, which her office says projects over $2 billion in revenue and B, economic expectations. If you are paying more money for your daily cup of joe one new report from fitch solution says get used to it a coffee price high is likely to last through next year experts say constrained supply from major coffee producers like vietnam brazil as well as colombia could keep costs up through 2022 vietnam is currently battling the worst COVID outbreak since the start of the pandemic and a lockdown has affected overseas shipments and other goods in Brazil. Meanwhile, waves of frost and drought have damaged crops. Bad weather has also impacted Colombia's harvest. Meanwhile, President Biden is turning his focus to the economy as the fight over how to pay for his massive infrastructure package intensifies. And with unemployment on the rise and prices of everyday goods like groceries going up, Americans are feeling the pinch. NBC's Alice Barr has more from Washington. Good afternoon. President Biden zeroing in on the economy today amid new signs of trouble for American workers and consumers. The president promising changes to the tax code to give the middle class a fair shot. Where is it written? All the tax breaks in the American tax code go to corporations and the very top. I think it's enough. I'm tired of it. It comes as unemployment claims ticked up last week to 332,000 after hitting a pandemic low. Another sign that the U.S. job market and the broader economy may be slowing down as the COVID Delta variant upends daily life. At the same time, prices are soaring, especially on food, with pandemic disruption squeezing the supply chain and adding to a shortage of truck drivers delivering to grocery stores and restaurants. We've had to change our menu quite a few times due to not being able to get items. President Biden insists the economic hardships are all the more reason to back his spending plans on infrastructure and the social safety net. He's promising raising taxes on corporations and the wealthy will offset the trillions of dollars in spending while evening the playing field. Ordinary, hardworking Americans, the people who built this country, have been basically cut out of the deal. But Republicans are sharply opposed. I've never seen such an effort to expand the reach of the federal government. Even some moderate Democrats are balking at the proposed price tag. Your time now, 725. Still to come on 18 News today, a successful splashdown for SpaceX after all that, that all civilian flight around planet Earth. We have that full video and we will show it to you coming up. And it's a great day to take your pet out for a walk and it will continue to be that way for the start of the week. Stay tuned for more weather details here on 18 News.
You're watching 18 News Today. Welcome back. It's foggy right now, as like it was yesterday, but it's yeah. gonna get nicer today, right? Oh yeah, it's gonna clear up. We're gonna see plenty of sunshine for the first week as well. Heading into Tuesday, however, we'll start to see some increasing clouds as a low pressure system starts to cross by just north of us. This low pressure system will bring in a chance for scattered showers and isolated storms as a cold front passes by our region. All right, thanks, Jacob. SpaceX Dragon six, uh, spacecraft has successfully splashed down Saturday evening. That is a tongue twister. The first all civilian crew put, prepared to re enter Earth's atmosphere as the crew got one last look at Earth from the capsule. As the Dragon capsule entered the atmosphere, temperatures on the exterior of the craft reached about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The capsule flies itself or fly, flies itself using pressure and and altitude sensors to determine when to deploy those parachutes. Thermal cameras captured the moment it could be seen by master control. The parachutes deployed to applause from the master control and then splash down. It was certainly a success. The time now 726 still to come on 18 news today. The battle over boosters. What's next for the Pfizer shot after the FDA voted to reject a third dose? Plus officials implemented a mask mandate in Pennsylvania schools, but there appears to be a loophole some parents are now using. We'll explain. Now on 18 News. Good morning. Battle over boosters. What's next for the Pfizer shot after the FDA voted to reject a third dose? And officials implementing mask mandates in Pennsylvania schools, but there appears to be a loophole some parents are now using. We'll explain. Plus, the second annual Maple City Festival in Hornell. We break down the full details from this event. This is 18 News Today. Live from your local news leader, this is 18 News Today. Good 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Wilson. Today is Sunday, September 19th. And I'm Jacob Matthews. Thanks for joining us for 18 News Today. Those stories and much more are coming up in just a few minutes, but first, Jacob has your forecast. Yes, uh, yet again, another foggy start to our day. 58 degrees is the current temperature in Elmira. The 97% humidity is what's giving this fog. Thankfully, as we thankfully later into the morning, we'll, that fog will eventually subside and some clouds that some, some clouds will start to move down a bit south from our area, leaving behind some uh, clearing skies for the afternoon. Current temperatures sitting in the twin tiers are in the, uh, the 50s, and then heading into the afternoon, those uh, temperatures will eventually rise up into the 70s, bringing in plentiful sunshine as clouds start to clear up. Winds will uh, increase a bit uh, in the middle of the afternoon, but then will slow down as we head into uh, 4 p.m. and slow down more with more clearing skies after that. Coronavirus cases in the United States have officially reached 42 million since the beginning of the pandemic. That's according to a new NBC News tally. The increase comes just seven days after the country reached 41 million cases. More than 676,000 deaths have been reported so far in the U.S. On a national level, new cases have started to come down from their midsummer levels, but several states are still experiencing increases in mass. In Maine, cases have gone up 56% in just the last two weeks. At least 70, 76% of all eligible Americans have gotten at least one dose, but some states are still encountering widespread vaccine hesitancy. The new numbers come just days after the FDA voted to reject Pfizer's request for booster shots, but the final decision hasn't necessarily been made just yet. Here's Anna Warnicki. The FDA's Independent Advisory Committee convened virtually Friday morning, hearing directly from the makers of the COVID-19 vaccine shot. The full duration of protection of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine is currently unknown. Senior Vice President of Pfizer's Clinical Research and Development, Dr. Bill Gruber, argued that a third booster shot is needed. Would be expected to restore protection and reduce COVID-19 illness and spread. But other health officials, including CDC's Sarah Oliver, said while vaccine efficacy has dropped in the last few months, it isn't clear why. The reasons for this lower effectiveness likely include both waning over time and the Delta variant. If FDA cannot assure us of the safety of two doses, how can they assure us of three? Dr. David Wiseman, who led the research and clinical trials for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, questioned the science behind Pfizer's data. They are short term. There is no randomized control. There are no clinical outcome data. The advisory panel declined to endorse the booster shot, so a vote will now head to the FDA for a final decision. And if the boosters are approved, the Biden administration says they're ready to jump into action. Yesterday, the CDC sent a message to state health officers laying out the process ahead and offering to help implement it in their jurisdiction. The CDC must also issue their recommendation on the booster shot. Their advisory committee meets on Wednesday. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. In New York, children ages two and older are now required to wear a mask at daycare centers. That's causing a strong reaction from some parents as well as daycare providers. Leaders at Mary's Little Lamb Child Care in Buffalo tell 18 News they want kids to be safe, but they do feel that this mandate is just too much. Assistant Director Stephanie Goodwill says wearing a mask makes it tougher for those kids to communicate. Some of our students having these masks on, we don't know what they're trying to say or communicate, especially if they don't have um, the words that they need to use. This mandate now brings New York State into compliance with the CDC's guidance, which was issued back in July. There's also a battle over face coverings in Pennsylvania. Thousands of students in the state are trying to shed their masks, saying they have a medical condition that prohibits them from wearing one. It comes as the state continues to battle fierce backlash from both parents as well as educators. The mask order went into effect on September 7th and applies to all K through 12 schools as well as child care facilities. But an apparent loophole is making it easier for parents in some districts to request medical exemptions. Those districts are using forms that require nothing more than a parent's signature.
It was the second annual Maple City Festival in Hornell yesterday. The popular fall festival returned after being canceled since 2019, bringing the fun back to the city with more games, prizes, performances and vendors for this year's event. This year was said to be a bigger event than last year. The first year there were crafts, food vendors and a street train attraction that drove throughout the festival. Hornell Partners for the Girls Business Improvement District manager says this year had 63 vendors in attendance. Hornell's signature event is back with more excitement for everyone to enjoy. Hornell Partners for Girls Business Improvement District Manager Valerie Whitehall says it's good to have the community in attendance after being canceled last year. A Hornell's second annual Maple City Festival. Uh, we did the first one in 2019 and obviously with 2020 we couldn't have it. As the festival was the event also offered a tasting tent on site to help raise money for two local veteran organizations. On top of that, Hornell schools were on site as volunteers to support the community as part of the festival. The Friends of Horseheads Free Library organization held their annual book sale yesterday. Horseheads residents stopped in to support and purchase books throughout the morning until 2 p.m. All proceeds earned from the book sale will benefit the library. The time now 738 still to come on 18 news today. The New York State Independent Redistricting Commission releasing its draft maps for the voting districts. More on the proposals and what happens next. And today is a great day to go out for a jog. My full forecast will explain what you can expect for today and the start of this week. Stay tuned for more. You're watching 18 news today. Welcome back. Over 1,100 Afghan refugees could soon be calling New York State home. It's part of the U.S. Department of State's Afghan Placement and Assistant Program. They're expected to head to their new communities, which include Albany, Rochester, and Syracuse. Between now and the end of March, they will be assisted by the Bureau of Refugee Services. Meanwhile, some New York firefighters are heading to California. Governor Hochul announced that on Friday that a crew of 20 wildland firefighters led by the state's DEC will assist firefighting efforts underway in the West for about two weeks. They're headed to Moreno Valley where they'll be staged prior to deployment. We, of course, wish them well and hope that they stay safe. 
Meanwhile, in Pennsylvania, firefighters made a heartbreaking discovery yesterday when they found a person dead in a chair after a fire tore through part of an apartment complex in Pennsylvania. Others in the building were forced to evacuate, but fortunately, firefighters got the flames under control about a half an hour after they arrived. Neighbors say the person who died was homebound and unable to move without help. The New York State Independent Redistricting Commission released its draft maps for voting districts. Line are, lines are drawn every 10 years after the census is complete. Our Capitol correspondent Karina Capabianca has more on the proposals and what happens next. In a move that was unexpected by some, the commission has put together two different sets of voting maps. Professor and senior fellow at New York Law School's Census and Redistricting Institute, Jeffrey Weiss, says the state constitution tasks the commission with releasing a draft map by September 15th, but they were unable to do that. Instead, uh, the Democratic and Republican sides release maps of their own. In the coming weeks, the commission will hold a second round of hearings across the state to receive input on the drafts. Weiss says the commission's job will then be to send a final map to the legislature by January 1st. If they can't come to an agreement, then they are supposed to send the maps with the most number of votes, which could be one plan with five votes, a Democratic one, and another plan from the Republicans with five votes. But that will leave it up to the legislature to draw a map of its own. And if it gets to the point where it's up to the legislature, the governor will also have to sign off on it. In Albany, Karina Capabianca. The time is now 744. Still to come on 18 News today, there's movie magic heading to New England. Hocus Pocus is back just in time for Halloween. We will have a look at the new set. And the next few days are a great time for you to cut your grass. How great will those days be? I will have the details in my full forecast after the break. Coming up on 18 Sports, a big day for football yesterday with Mansfield opening their season at home. Plus, the White Ad in Happy Valley. Sports is next. Good morning and happy Sunday. Expect some fog in the early morning hours, but this will eventually change as we head into the afternoon with plentiful sunshine and comfort. This will also be the same for the first half of the week. The fall season is going to officially start next week, giving us the much needed cooler weather that we all wished for. Looking at the uh, the regional, I mean the satellite and radar, you can see clear conditions uh, going up 
coming around in the uh, the northeast area with a high pressure system uh, just north of us heading into the Elmira and Twin Tiers region the uh, the clear conditions as you can see the are uh, underway right now with uh, clouds just moving uh, south of our area this will also be true for uh, the afternoon hours Sunday we'll start start to see this uh, low, this high pressure system uh, moving uh, more into the New England states. Monday morning, this uh, high pressure system will then move over into the state of Maine and closer to the Atlantic Ocean. This will bring in some more cloud cover for our area, as can be seen right here. Heading into a Tuesday morning, we'll be introduced to this low pressure system just over the Great Lakes. Now, as this low pressure system crosses into, the, uh, into Canada, just north of us, for Tuesday afternoon, it will introduce a cold front which will bring potential for scatter showers and isolated thunderstorms as can be seen from this line right here just over into the Midwest and extending out into the Great Lakes. Current temperatures in the, uh, the region right now are in, sitting in the, hot, the mid to high 50s. For dew points, the, they are also sitting comfortably in the, uh, the 50s, much more comfortable than uh, yesterday giving us uh, a lot more dry conditions uh, rather than uh, humid ones like yesterday. And honestly, I, I am very pleased to have um, much more drier conditions because it was really humid last night and I'm happy and I'm sure you're happy too. High temperature for today, 74 degrees, sunshine, like I said, nice and dry. Heading into tonight, the low temperature will drop down to 48 with mostly clear conditions and will introduce another patchy fog like this uh, morning. For the first half of the week, we'll uh, see more of those uh, sunny conditions. Tuesday, we'll start to see the, the cloud cover uh, build up. And as we head into Wednesday, the, uh, the cold front, like I mentioned before, will bring in the chance for scatter showers and isolated thunderstorms. This will be the same for Thursday, but heading into the end of the week, we'll start to see those, uh, that rain uh, subside, giving us mostly sunny conditions and temperatures dropping down to the 60s, signifying the start of the fall season. Six hundred eighty-five days. That's how long it's been since Mansfield Sprint Football played a game since losing last season to the pandemic. They came together again under the lights at Carl Van Norman Field last night against an old foe. Mansfield hosting Cornell Sprint last night. We go to the second quarter. Mansfield freshman quarterback Kasid Raymond. He's going to get on his horse. It's a seventy-five-yard Mounties touchdown. A big one for Mansfield in their return home. We go to the second. Raymond rolling, floating one deep. He finds Isaiah Grundin. He reels it in. It's a 50-yard touchdown. Mansfield continues to pilot it on against Cornell, but for Cornell looking to respond. We go to the end of his half. Xavier Martinez, he's going to buy time, rolls out and finds Evan Nicholas for the first down. It's not enough, though. Mansfield wins a blowout in their season opener, 48-3. Raymond finishes the game with two passing touchdowns and two rushing touchdowns. For the Mounties, more college football is the greatest spectacle in all of sports. Last night, nearly 110,000 people packing Beaver Stadium for the whiteout Penn State versus Auburn. First, qu first quarter, Penn State in the red zone. Sean Clifford keeps his eyes down the field and he finds Jahan Doxson floating one and a big touchdown for the Penn State wide receiver. We go now to a Wildcat setup. It's the tight end Tyler Warren who gets the snap. And he flies in for the Penn State touchdown to extend their lead. Fourth quarter, Penn State up by one. Noah Kane cuts his way in on the third down for another Nittany Lions touchdown, but the Tigers not going away quietly. Fourth and goal with three minutes left, down by eight. Bo Nix floats one, but it's out of bounds. The Nittany Lions hold on and may stave off Auburn to stay undefeated. Penn State wins 28-20. Dino Babers and the Orange hosting Albany in the Dome's opening drive of the game. Sean Tucker with an eight-yard scamper for the Orange. This is going to cap off a 13-play drive for that Syracuse offense as they continue to roll now. Under seven minutes left in the first. It's Tucker again cutting through the Great Danes defense. He takes it all the way to the house for 56 yards. Tucker, five touchdowns on the day. The Orange trounce for Great Danes 62-24. to Here's coach after the game. It's going to be uphill from here. So this was an opportunity for us to fine tune some things and play a good opponent that was tough. They hit us. They were physical. They were really hitting out there. Um, but th that timing is really important, and that's what we were trying to get today. Hulk, smart Hulk or angry Hulk. 
That'll uh, determine his proficiency. Syracuse will face undefeated Liberty in a night game next week at the Domes. High school football, Corning Hawks in action yesterday. They're taking on Monroe Woodbury on the road. Opening drive for Hawks. They strike first. Landon Birch hands it off to Logan Booker. Booker takes it 30 yards to the house for the score Corning. They go up six to nothing. Birch looking to do the same in the air this time. Connects with Booker down the field. Booker jukes his defender. He finds the end zone on a 39 yard touchdown play. Later in this one, Dylan Fairchild makes an impact as he muscles his way into the end zone. Corning wins 28 to 12 on the road. Eight man football with Edison. They're hosting Notre Dame earlier today in the rain. The Spartans, though, raining down some offense on the Crusaders. The quarterback, Michael Brown, with the keeper dashing through the defense, taking it in for Edison. That ties it up 12 apiece here in the second quarter. Spartans go for two. Brown flips it to Deshaun Cook to go up 14 to 12. Notre Dame defense showing up here. Brown looking to run it, but the senior Dylan Clark wraps him up for a big stop. Crusaders now on offense. They look to go ahead with seconds left in the half. It's Clark again. He goes on the sweep and he gets big yards up to midfield, but he gets laid out. We call that one a hit stick. Kyle Walburn flies out of nowhere and the Spartans are feeling it. They roll over Notre Dame in their home opener, 42 to 18. Local scoreboard from, from yesterday, Bath Haverling boys soccer shut out Alfred Allman. Kiefer Calkins with five goals for the Rams. Elmira College men's soccer, Gavin Wise picking up the Soaring Eagles only goal in their shutout win over Russell Sage College. The women's game went scoreless through two overtimes for them to take the tie. Baseball yesterday, Yankees blown out 11 to three by the Indians. The Mets, they lose a tough one to the Phillies five to three. Gene Segura with a two run home run for Philadelphia. They move to within a game and a half out of the division. The Mets, they drop to six back in the National League East. And that'll be all for sports for 18 Sports. I'm George Stockburger. The confusion over COVID booster shots continues as experts disagree on if and when Americans need a third dose of a vaccine as breakthrough infections rise. I'll break that and all the latest coronavirus news down with none other than Dr. Anthony Fauci. Plus, the direction of the post-Trump Republican Party is becoming more and more clear. It's not very post-Trump these days as the former president shows his support for this weekend's pro-insurrectionist rally at the Capitol. Another elected Republican who voted for impeachment announces his retirement due to the toxic dynamics inside his party. So this is Trump's party. And President Biden's approval rating, meanwhile, is dropping amidst the worsening pandemic, the chaotic Afghanistan withdrawal. Also what's happening at the border and his struggle to deliver on his policy promises with a closely divided Congress. It's all ahead this Sunday on Meet the Press.
Tomorrow morning on Sunday Today, my conversation with Tony, Grammy, and Emmy-winning singer and actress Cynthia Erivo. She made a big name for herself and won that Tony in Oprah Winfrey's Broadway revival of The Color Purple before playing American icons Harriet Tubman and Aretha Franklin on film. Now she's out with her first solo album and a new children's book that pays tribute to mothers and daughters. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to create a book that felt simple enough to teach young kids to dream big dreams, but fill it with all the detail you can. And I imagine you drew some personal inspiration yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cynthia Erivo, plus the latest news and another life well lived when Sunday Today airs at 6 a.m. out in L.A. Now, if you're not up at that hour on a Sunday, we understand. You can just set the DVR and we will see you whenever you're ready for us. You're watching 18 News Today. Welcome back. There is movie magic that's being made in Rhode Island. Excitement is brewing in Lincoln as locals begin to see the first glimpse of Hocus Pocus 2 right in their state. And unlike the first movie, which was shot in Massachusetts and Hollywood, this sequel will be shot entirely in Rhode Island starting next month. Crews are transforming Chase Farm Park into a 1600 eras movie set with eight structures, historic buildings in Providence will also be used. The state says this is a massive economic opportunity for them. The impact impact is expected to be about $100 million. All of this work, all of this construction will happen for about 10 weeks and consist of only two nights of filming, likely starting the first week of October. Hocus Pocus 2 will debut on Disney in 2020, 2022. I'm a little disappointed it's not this year, but that's okay. All right, Jacob, we're heading into fall. The weather's getting a little better, at least cooler, which we I like to see. I don't know about anybody else, but what's it looking like for the rest of the week? So for the rest of the week, we can expect plentiful sunshine and comfort for at least the first part of the week. But heading into Wednesday, scattered showers and isolated thunderstorms will arrive as a cold front passes through the regions. The latter half of the week will eventually subside these uh, scattered showers and isolated thunderstorms, bringing in temperatures down to the 60s, and that will officially uh, start the fall season. All right, thanks, Jacob. Well, thank you for joining us for 18 News today. Have a, the Today Show is next. Have a great day.